So good evening. My name is Albertina Albos Lawrence. I am the deputy chair of the law faculty and the chair of the advisory board for Cambridge Women in Law. I am delighted to welcome all of you to today's event, whose theme is a discussion about the work of women in publicly funded law. This is the first event organized jointly by Cambridge Women in Law and the Cambridge University Graduate Law Society. One of the objectives of Cambridge Women in Law is to promote the crucial role that Cambridge Law alumni play in inspiring and supporting younger generations of women lawyers, and also to provide a strong platform for interaction between them. We are therefore thrilled that this event represents just that. We have this evening an impressive array of panelists who have very kindly agreed to take a number of questions. With us today, we have Alison Munro, a barrister at Garden Court Chambers, specializing in family and public law. Buzola Johnson, a specialist prosecutor in the Specialist Crime and Counterterrorism Division at the Crown Prosecution Service. Kaylin Gallagher, a barrister at Doughty Street Chambers, specializing in human rights, and Olivia McGinnis, a barrister at One Garden Court Chambers Family Law, and an expert in the application of human rights law in cases involving children. The panel will be chaired by Professor Nikki Patfield, Professor of Criminal and Penal Justice here at the University of Cambridge, and the Director of the Cambridge Center for Criminal Justice. Before I hand over to Professor Patfield for the discussion, I would like to thank her and the panelists very much in advance for joining us today. I would also like to thank Julia Freitag, the president of the Graduate Law Society, Claire Gordon, our wonderful development associate, and Dan Bates on the technical side for all their help and their work organizing this exciting event. So without any further delay, I leave the floor to Professor Patfield. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Albertina. Uh, and now we'll dump this Professor Pedfield stuff and we'll become much more informal, I hope. Um, we're all absolutely um, exhausted, I think, by Zoom and we're longing to meet and hug and talk about life in real ways. And I hope that in this session we can be as informal as possible. Now being informal is really difficult on these events and how are we going to do the discussion? I'm not going to talk for very long. I'm going to throw the um, floor open to the panelists. The panelists have seen a list of seven questions that they've been forearmed with and I'll leave it to them largely to fight it out between them. And I have no doubt that we're going to have a very lively debate and that the time will flow very fast. And at 7.30, we'll all be sad that it's over. Um, we haven't really choreographed it in any sense because it seems to me it's not such fun to do it that way. I'm um, grateful to have been invited to chair it. Um, thank you, Albertina, representing the Cambridge Women in Law. Thank you very much, Julia, the Cambridge University Graduate Law Society. What are my credentials to chair this? Well, I'm a failed barrister. So um, I hope that you're all going to be, the people in the audience are all going to be convinced that they really want to go into public law because we need you. We sure do need you out there. And I hope the message this evening isn't too negative. I did my pupillage in 197 and left the bar in London to go and practice in the Gambia and never went back to practice and it is one of my regrets in life it would be um, something that I haven't done I've sat as a part-time judge a recorder but I haven't done what these wonderful women have done and so um, I really look forward to this evening to hearing from them about life in public funded law. Now everybody's going to say there's not enough money, it's chaotic, the pandemic's made it worse, but hey these four wonderful women are doing it and they're not doing it because they don't like doing it. So can I start off by asking each of you just to introduce yourselves, say something jolly just for a couple of minutes. If you want to choose one of those questions to hit straight in on, 
you're very welcome. But I'm not asking at this moment, I think, for a 10 minute speech from each of you. If we could just have a, a two, minute, two minute introduction from each of you, and then we'll go from there. So um, I'll follow the same order, which I don't quite know what the order is, but it's the order that I have, and it's the order that Albertina had. So Alison, would you like to introduce yourself to the crowd, the invisible crowd? Mm -hmm. Oh, and people, when you want to ask specific questions, please ask them in the Q&A. And I'm going to keep an eye on that Q&A all the time and allow your questions, in a sense, to interrupt. We're not going to leave questions to the end. When you have a burning question, ask it in the Q&A. And I'll sadly be the translator. I don't think we've set it up, have we, Dan, for the people in the audience to ask the questions themselves. So probably I'll do the translating of your questions, but um, please do ask questions via the Q&A, chat via the chat if you want to, and we'll go from there. So Alison, sorry, I interrupted you already. Not at all. Thank you very much, Nikki, and um, thank you everyone for inviting me um, to be on the panel this evening with such wonderful speakers. Um, I'm very grateful. Um, I'm sure it'll be a, a, an interesting and thought-provoking session. Um, a little bit about myself. My name is Alison Munro. Um, I practice at Garden Court Chambers. Um, I have a mixed practice which is perhaps slightly unusual in as much as I um, have been practicing since 1992. Um, I used to primarily be a criminal defence barrister but I've always done family public law um, and inquests and inquiries and life changes over the years and my practice has changed over the years and I've now arrived, um, you know, 27, 28 years later, and um, I'm primarily a family practitioner who does a lot of inquests, um, public inquiries, and hardly any crime at all. Um, it's, it's strange for me that, you know, this has been my career because um, um, I, I started back in 1985 at Newnham. I did history, had no intention of doing law whatsoever, saw myself as being a historian really and being an academic um, and I sort of came into law through politics and through campaigning work that I was doing um, did the law conversion course um, and ended up as a barrister and very fortunately for me I have all my professional life only been at two chambers I started as a pupil at Garden Court um, went then to Tooks Chambers when Tooks spent 25 years there when Tooks ended I came back to Garden Court both Garden Court and Tooks, and perhaps with a few others, such as Doughty Street, where Keelan's at, um, are regarded, for the sake of a better word, as radical sets, human rights sets, sets that are political, that do certain types of work and has a, a certain ethos. So I think perhaps I've been somewhat insulated at the bar in as much as my experience um, of colleagues has been probably very different to many people at the bar and, and I say that in terms of diversity which is you know obviously buzzword now but 25 years ago I was in a diverse set of chambers in terms of its mix and gender and people of colour and, and people's sexuality people were open about that because of the nature and the, um, the community that we were in as the chamber so I've had a very different experience perhaps but that's informed me and my politics has informed the kind of work I do um, at the moment, I'm representing a number of the families on the Grenfell inquiry, um, and, and that to me is, again, very much part and parcel of bringing together campaigning community-based work and legal work. Keelan and I know each other well. We were on Hillsborough together up in the northwest for a, a number of years, and again, that's, that was another experience that you were representing people and you felt that you were actually making a difference to their lives. So that's a little bit about me, where I come from, what, what I want to do, what I'm doing at the moment. Um, and I hopefully will ask, answer some more questions as the evenings go on. Thank you. I'm sure you will. We're, I'm already full of questions for you, but we're going to go on to Busola. You're muted. 
<laughs> I had a meeting this afternoon and every other minute there was, you're on mute. And I think in 50 years time, we'll tell our nieces and nephews and children about this bizarre time when all we said was, you're on mute and they just won't know what we mean. Um, I'm really thrilled and really honoured to be um, here tonight. I studied law at Lucy Cavendish and I already had a degree in philosophy from UCL. And that's when I met the amazing um, Nikki Padfield and she was my my favourite tutor and uh, really gave me an amazing love for constitutional law and so I was so thrilled I think a year or two ago when we reconnected um, so I'm I'm really delighted to um, be here. Um, I am 50 in two weeks time I was called to the bar in 1998 and last year was the first time I really calculated how many years ago I was called. And I was astonished to find that it was over 20 years ago, uh, because in many ways, I feel as if I know as little now as I did then. Um, or maybe I just know how much I don't know. And at that time, I thought I knew everything. But um, so initially, I was in chambers. Um, I was at Nine Gough Square Chambers, which is a general common law set. And it did very kind of good quality crime. And I decided to leave because I just felt that um, I was a bit different and difference wasn't really celebrated in that set. They're very nice people. You know, I, I've got nothing bad to say about them, really. But it just felt that I wasn't I didn't kind of belong there in any uh, meaningful way. So I joined the CPS. Um, I was first a Crown Advocate and then I managed a team of Crown Advocates at Snaresbrook Crown Court. And one of the amazing things that I discovered about working in the civil service is that there are huge numbers of opportunities for lawyers in the in the civil service. Um, and so from from the CPS, I then went to the Home Office and worked at the UK Central Authority, which helps um, the UK and foreign countries to get evidence and people in and out. So we do mutual legal assistance. They did mutual legal assistance and extradition. From there, I got a job at the European Commission. So I worked in Brussels for a year um, drafting mutual legal recognition instruments. And that's all ancient history for us now because we're out of the EU. But it was really interesting. And I moved my husband and my dog and we went to Brussels for a year. It was really fascinating. So when I came back, I applied and got applied for and got my current job which I have to tell you is my favourite job since I qualified and I really love it. And my current job is prosecuting mostly um, corporate manslaughters and gross negligence manslaughters, as well as uh, misconduct in public office and election offences. So it's a really specialised area of law. It's incredibly interesting. I feel like, Alison, that I'm, I'm doing the right thing in every case because Unlike most homicide cases, the suspects in our cases are usually people like me and you who are at work and something terrible happens and they kill someone. And I'm really aware all the time about the fact that the investigation is hanging over their heads, um, often for years at a time, and I want to do the right thing and only charge them if there's enough evidence. We've got bereaved families, on the other hand, who have lost somebody that they love. So it feels like important work. Um, the question, I won't answer it now, but I just want to bagsy it in advance. The question that I really find interesting is, do clients treat you with respect and have you experienced racism or sexism at work? And so may I please ask Nikki to ask me about that question in due course. <laughs> and when I forget, you will doubtless remind me. Thank you very you. much. Yes. Keelan. Uh, thanks very much, Nikki. And um, what a pleasure to be here uh, sharing a virtual room with you all and to follow uh, Alison and Basola, who I uh, really admire greatly in many ways. Uh, so uh, my name is Keelan Gallagher QC. The spelling is just there to fool you. It's one of those classic Irish names with lots of spare uh, letters. Um, I've got to say, when I was uh, appointed um, a silk a number of years ago, a number of my colleagues said, you're the last person who needs some extra consonants in your name. Do you really need a QC added? But there we are. Um, so it's just Keelan. And uh, I think some of you may know that uh, I was referred to, Alison, I'm sure you know this. I was doing a case a number of years ago, the 7-7 um, London bombings case, acting for a number of bereaved families and a rather enthusiastic spell check uh, by a journalist uh, reported that barrister Cauliflower Gallagher had made a particular argument in court. 
So it is Keelan, and thank you for pronouncing it properly, everyone. Um, so I do look very committed to the brand this evening with the Doughty Street backdrop. Uh, it's not because I'm particularly corporate and committed to the brand. It's in reality because I'm in chambers having just done a hearing and my bookshelves are A, untidy and B, have confidential client information. So that's why I've used it. I'm conscious in this age of Zoom uh, that there is a new concept of bookcase credibility, which I see Nikki and Albertina are doing very well on. Um, but I would not be doing well if you could see uh, my backdrop. There's even now a service in curating your bookshelves on Zoom where someone will arrange your bookshelves so that you hit particular notes, which is like um, an Irish author referred many centuries ago to a service of someone coming in and reading your books and dog earing them and putting sensible marginalia in to make you look well read. So there's a Zoom equivalent. Anyway, um, so uh, one of the reasons I'm really delighted to be here today is because uh, I went to Cambridge as a graduate, so I'm a little different to some others on the panel. And it was a lifetime, a life changing experience for me when I went to Cambridge. So I came to Cambridge uh, as a graduate student, having done my undergraduate degree in uh, Dublin and having done my barrister training in Dublin and having done a master's in Dublin and fully intending that I was going to return to practice at the bar there. Um, but uh, I spent a year doing the LLM in Cambridge. Um, I met my husband there doing a PhD uh, and uh, I've stayed ever since and uh, it really was because of the teaching that I had at Cambridge and uh, particular guidance from Pippa Rogerson who many of you will know uh, at Keyes uh, that I uh, changed course really. So I had a very clear plan and suddenly in my mid-twenties changed my mind and it was because of the time I had at Cambridge so I'm really pleased to be here and I think it's useful to hear from someone who um, was also at Cambridge as a graduate, but not as an undergraduate. And uh, at the time when I was there, certainly the graduate population was um, in some ways more diverse than the undergraduate population. So I'm a state school pupil, um, you know, I'm not from a background of privilege at all. And there was certainly at the time when I was there quite a distinction between um, the graduate and undergraduate population in some ways. Um, but my time was wonderful there. And after I was there, uh, I was completely certain that I wanted to practice as a specialist in human rights and civil liberties law. Before that, I'd intended, as you have to at the Irish Bar, I'd intended to be doing as much human rights law as I could, but necessarily you have to be a generalist at the Irish Bar. So it would have also involved doing landlord and tenant work and a whole range of other civil pieces of work with human rights probably making up about 15% or 20% of your practice if you're lucky. But I was sure that I wanted to specialize in it um, after my time in Cambridge. So I spent a number of years at Liberty, the um, NGO, and then I transferred to the Bar of England and Wales uh, in 2005, um, just a few weeks actually after the um, London bombings and the um, decision about the Olympics. And actually that was a time when um, many people will be familiar with this as immigrants who live in uh, the UK. It's the first time when I really felt like a Londoner. I didn't feel British, but I felt like a Londoner over that summer. And then I started at the bar. And so I've been at the bar for 15 years, um, specializing in human rights. As Alison says, our paths have crossed in many ways, particularly on Hillsborough, but also I've had the same experience as Alison in that you start at the bar knowing you want to do human rights work, but actually the precise shape that that takes, um, you change your view uh, as time goes on and you discover areas that you knew nothing about. So I was very firm when I started about international human rights law, the right to protest, freedom of expression, which are all things that I do in my practice, but I knew very little about some very practical areas of work, which I uh, now love and see as hugely important. Things like community care. So making late night applications for homeless children to secure a roof over their head, for example, really fundamental bread and butter human rights work, which I just didn't know about particularly before I came to the bar. So your practice does change, I think, as you come in. And um, the one thing I wanted to say uh, at the start really is uh, there is uh, a quote, let me see if I can find it because I may misremember it. Uh, there is uh, a quote from Roald Dahl, um, which I wanted to just give to you. Um, and it is from, um, yeah, it's from my uncle Oswald. And it is, I began to realize how important it was to be an enthusiast in life. He taught me that if you're interested in something, no matter what it is, go at it full speed ahead. Embrace it with both arms, hug it, love it, and above all, become passionate about it. Lukewarm is no good. Hot is no good either. Quite hot and passionate is the only thing to be. And the single thing I would say right at the outset is 
uh, what you need to do, your working life is long, you need to have something that you're white hot and passionate about and that makes you want to get out of bed in the morning. I got out of bed in the morning uh, this morning at 5 a.m. to a message from my client Maria Ressa in the Philippines who's in dire circumstances and I am happy to get up at 5 a.m. to speak to Maria Ressa. I am confident that I would not be happy to get up at 5 a.m. to deal with some aspects of corporate finance, for example. So as well as doing something that's worthwhile, it's something that actually gives you the drive to get up and go. And it's also something, thinking of Hillsborough, uh, which makes uh, up for the difficult times. I'm a mother of three young children. This is the last thing I'll say in opening. I'm the mother of three young children. And many of the cases that I do take me away from my family for a number of days at a time or sometimes uh, for extended periods. And when you are finding that very difficult as a working parent with young children, uh, the one thing that keeps me going is when you are acting for clients who have lost a loved one, uh, the fact that you are missing your family really pales into insignificance. So with Hillsborough, as Alison knows, we traveled up on a regular basis. We were in Warrington for months on end and weeks on end and only coming back at weekends. And every time I found that difficult and found that tough, I just used it as more of a driver to try to work for my clients who lost their children, whose children went to a football match and never came home. And I think when you're doing a job that you are passionate about, you can into motivators to do your job better. It was rather a long start. Brilliant. <laughs> Apologies, well, Nikki. White, hot and passionate. That's good. Um, Olivia, how are you going to introduce yourself, please? Well, I am also delighted to be here and thank you very much for having me. I am a Christ's graduate. I did my undergrad there from 2000 to 2003 and was taught by both Nikki and Albertina. So it's extremely nice to be back in a virtual room with them. Um, I, I did study law as an undergrad, uh, mainly because I had read and watched Rumpole and felt that that was really the life for me. It helped that I thought I might be doing something quite important, but I wanted a job that I enjoyed. That was really uh, the key for me. So that was undergraduate law. And then I joined a common law set as a pupil in 2004. Can I interrupt you, Olivia? Do you know why we're not seeing your face move? Have you frozen your photograph? Because if, I... it's, an, if it's an error, that's um, you could make us see you talking, but if it's just the system, I think none of us are actually seeing your face moving. We've got a very nice photo of you, but we haven't <laughs> got you actually talking. It's definitely not deliberate. There Is we that... are. That's, you've no. cut, you're normal now. Right. I had just frozen. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, my tech is very, very low down my list of skills, I'm afraid. <laughs> so if something goes wrong, I can't fix it. Um, I, yeah. So I was at a common law set for pupillage and for the first 10 years of my practice, I started out doing pretty much exclusively criminal defence and uh, slowly developed a bit of an interest in particularly child abuse, children proceedings, family proceedings. And so I had a mixed practice for a while until I joined my current set in 2016, uh, having been an exclusively family practitioner for some time by then. And I represent predominantly parents in um, proceedings where the state has intervened if there are allegations of uh, abuse sexual or physical and radicalization or neglect that's really where my publicly funded practice is um, I couldn't agree more with what the panelists have said so far and in particular Keelan white hot and passionate feels like really the only way to endure the bad times in this job because there are some and they are intense but it is a wonderful, wonderful thing to be doing with my time. It's much easier to get out of bed in the morning to do something that you care about and something that feels important in some way, even if, as certainly I often am, uh, uh, you're on the wrong you're on the wrong side of it, really. Um, 
so far as being a woman at the bar is concerned, uh, I'll just tell you uh, some tiny personal details so that you know I have a three year old son and I'm about six weeks away from maternity leave with baby number two, all being well. And um, so far as uh, something fun and lighthearted, my dog had his first haircut today and I thought you might all like to know that. He's seven months old and he's great. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Wonderful. So now you're all here. And rather than going to the questions, I straight away like the Q&A questions. Have you all worked out how to look at the Q&A? Um, the participants can't see them. So I will read out this question from anonymous attendee. It sounds very un-Cambridge to be anonymous, um, but you're allowed to be anonymous. My question for Alison, I'm wondering when you say that your politics and values brought you to the bar, why it was you felt that being a barrister was a good career for that purpose. I'm drawn to the bar for the same reason, but find it hard to explain why when people ask, wouldn't it be better to be an activist, start an NGO, be a politician? And I think that's a great question. And it's for you, Alison. Thank you. Yeah, it's a great, it is a great question. Um, I, as I said, when, when I was studying history, I, I saw my, my career path as being an academic. But at the same time, I was always heavily involved in politics. When, when as an undergraduate, um, I was very much involved with um, Labour students, and in my third year, was um, chair of the Labour Club. And we had in those days, this is back in the in the mid eighties, we had what was called University Left. So it would be an amalgamation of various groups: the Greens, um, the um, SDP. Remember them? The Liberal Party and the Labour Club and the Communist students would all we would all be you know in student elections we'd have a joint platform it was a bit of a rainbow coalition really in, in um, back in the mid 80s and so I saw myself perhaps being an academic but I was also drawn to politics or you know being involved in politics and when I graduated I did um, I went for an interview to be a researcher with my local Labour MP possibly the worst interview that anybody in the history of interviews has ever had. I ended up argue, having an argument with him, telling him why his politics were wrong, um, what he was doing wrong <laughs> as a constituency MP. Surprisingly enough, he didn't give me the job. <laughs> um, and it was at that point I thought, no, politicians, no, politics is not the way to go. You need to find something that in engages the community, that actually you're working face to face with people. And at the same time, you're making an effective change. And it sort of dawned on me that, you know, actually being a lawyer could well be that answer you know that, that encompasses all those aspects of um, community work campaigning work but you're actually able to affect change you know in the law courts um, and so I was fortunate enough to do a mini pupillage at Tux Chambers which is where I spent the majority of my professional career um, it was run by Michael Mansfield um, had amazing, we had an amazing set of um, barristers there. And, it, you know, after a week of the mini pupillage, it cemented my view that, yes, there are people at the bar who are like me, because I too came from a state school background. Um, and despite going to Cambridge, you know, I still very much felt like an outsider when I got to the bar. Um, and it made me think there are people who are like me, there are people who have both similar principles. There are people who, um, you know, are not motivated simply by um, career um, goals and wanting to make money, but by actually wanting to achieve and affect change as best they can. I'm not saying it's perfect in any shape or form, but that really cemented for me the notion that this was um, something you can do rather than being a politician, rather than working for an NGO or um, a, a, a group like that, where you're actively um, obviously campaigning and working with people, but being a barrister, being a solicitor, you can be part of actually changing somebody's life. You know, what you do in, be it representing somebody on a small case in the magistrate's court or doing Grenfell or Hillsborough at the, at the other extreme in terms of size and publicity and magnitude. You affect people's life and can affect people's life for the better. And it's a really immediate, um, sense of, 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 of affecting change. So I think that for me was the motivating 
factor. And I have to say over the years, I, I, I do think there have been times where I've been incredibly frustrated, but I, I still, even now, after all those years, and I was called in 1992, still feel that it's an area of work that I can do and I can actually have a platform. And as I've become more senior, your platform grows. I took Silk last year and I was one of six, amazingly, six black women QCs who were appointed. Um, you know, we're rare as hen's teeth, quite frankly, but for six of us in a, one go, um, that was something. Um, and it's, it was really interesting because of course we then sort of like spent most of last year doing webinars because they were like, oh, we need those six black women again, get them on. Um, but it was great because it gave us a platform to talk about our experiences as women, as black women, and, and you know, getting past that, breaking through that glass ceiling um, and, and achieving things that you can then, because representation matters, you then become somebody that other young black men and women, other working class, for me, working class people can look to and think, well, if she can get there, I can get there. If she can do something that's making it a real difference, then I can do that's something that's making a real difference. So, so those are the reasons, um, slightly rambling, multifaceted reasons why I, I felt that the legal route was the best one, as opposed to going into politics. Or... And I would inter interrupt and say that um, it's still not too late for your political career, is it? <laughs> um, there are many people who move on. Did any of the rest of you think about, yes, I, Ke Keelan, you, you're yeah. all going to be a politician um, Well, I, I was just going to make that point, Alison, that it's not too late. My colleague yeah. is obviously Keir Starmer, who is a very successful silk, Alison. You may have heard of him. <laughs> so you have another route. Um, but also for me, I, I share Alison's view, and I think the question's a really good one. Uh, for me, it was social justice first and then law second. So I've always struggled when people, um, I, I taught for a while at the um, LSE and I had first year students. And when I asked them, why have you become a lawyer? A lot of them would say, well, medicine or law, or they would talk about wanting money. You would be connected to their academic results or finances. And I always find that very strange because for me, it wasn't, I would not be a house, I would not be a landlord and tenant lawyer, and I would not be a financial services lawyer, a commercial lawyer. So for me, it was always a driver to want to do social justice and human rights work. And law was a means to achieve that. And that, that was a large part of the reason why I decided to um, stay and practice from London, which gives you so many international opportunities in a way that you don't necessarily have in other jurisdictions. So I, I grappled with exactly the issue that the person asking the question um, has put, just like Alison did, you know, thinking, well, should I go down the NGO route? And of course, I did, in fact, work for an NGO uh, for a period of time uh, after um, being at Cambridge. So for me, I've always seen the value of law as an instrument of social change. And just to give you some really practical examples on that, um, in international human rights, um, being a lawyer uh, allows you uh, to do things which you could not do with other skills and just as an NGO, working in an NGO without those skills. So for example, I've got the privilege of leading the international team for Daphne Caruana Galizia's family, the Maltese journalist who was assassinated in 2017 and working with the family who are absolutely incredible and working with some very brilliant free speech organizations uh, like Reporters Without Borders and really fantastic civil society activists in Malta, uh, we have managed to secure the first ever Article 2 investigation uh, in Malta into a DEP. So they don't have an inquest system in the same way that we have here. They don't have a system where you explore whether a death was preventable. Uh, what lessons should be learnt, what the state complicity was. That's all just done through the criminal justice system ordinarily. So we managed to achieve that. And that is only something that we've managed to achieve through the use of law. We wouldn't have been able to do it just lobbying in another way. So I really would emphasize that if you are keen on the issue of social change and um, human rights, rule of law, um, yeah. in other fields. Thank you very much. I'm going to go on straight away, I think, to another question. And Cynthia Fernando's question is, I think, typical of many um, general questions which will come your way. Hello, I'm a final year undergraduate, very interested in becoming a barrister specialising in public law and human rights. What can I expect and what can I do now to get there? Now, that seems to me a lovely question because it's very typical of a third year undergraduate. I know I want to be there. Can you tell me whether I'm right 
because I don't quite know what I'm expecting. And then this endless thing, what should I do to get it? You know, how do I build my CV in the right way? How, how would any of you like to answer Cynthia's question? Olivia, I'll choose you yeah. since everybody's quiet. Fine, I, I'll, I'll probably defer the more, the more kind of pure public law aspects to others on the panel who are definitely more knowledgeable in that respect. But I certainly sit on our pupillage uh, so I'm not on the committee, but I do do the marking um, and I have done that in my previous chambers as well. And um, what you what you need to do from a chambers perspective is I suspect what you already know you need to do. So mooting is brilliant and any um, evidence that you can give in a pupillage application of arguing uh, whether on paper or in a mooting competition, that's really valuable and considered to be a very good indication, not only of uh, your own ability and commitment to developing your skills, but of course, hopefully it's given you an idea of whether you actually like this or not. Because particularly in the kinds of, in the areas of law where in your second six, you are up on your feet and arguing, actually it's good for you as well as for chambers to have a sense that that's something you're going to enjoy rather than find paralyzingly awful as a friend and ex-colleague of mine did. So mooting is great. Mini pupillages are of course what we are looking for and uh, a number of those will be helpful although you don't need to have a million of them under your belt. We, we appreciate and accept that there are financial constraints on the number of mini pupillages a person can do over a summer, for example. If you uh, don't live in a place where you're close to chambers and you would have to be um, commuting in and out every day, all of that can be taken and is taken into account. So mooting is very important. And of course, your grades are very important. If you um, are taking a break following completion of your undergraduate degree from um, a chamber's application perspective, lots of uh, extracurricular stuff um, is helpful. Law clinics, pro bono, the projects that you can do in the States in de on death row, or any of these um, activities that you can do that show again your commitment to what uh, your career is going to be and also your own development of your skill set before you get to us all of that's really important um, but there is no hard and fast path and I, I think probably other panelists would agree the bar is I think quite unusual in that you often have people coming from another career and that is completely standard. People who have been in finance, people who have been in journalism, people who have been in politics. My, my co-pupil was an actor for 10 years before he applied to the bar. So, um, you know, whilst I, I say that there are all these things that will help your application, equally bear in mind that if you can justify what you have done and why you took a route A rather than route B, that will be of lots of interest to the chambers you're applying to, I'm sure. Does anyone want to add to that useful answer? Yeah, Keelan? Yeah, that was a really helpful answer. J just a couple of very quick points. Um, the first thing is um, that uh, I agree with the point Olivia's made about so many people coming from other careers. So, you know, we have had a range of pupils who've come from um, running a small NGO, for example, um, having been a police officer, having been a journalist, uh, we quite often have pupils who are into their 40s or even their 50s. And in fact, interestingly, we um, do a lot of self-reflection on uh, our recruitment processes, and we were concerned that we may have an age discrimination issue in the sense that um, it's difficult to see, no matter how brilliant you are as a 23-year-old, how you'd get in uh, in those circumstances. So we've adjusted our processes to take account of that. And I think particularly in public law, especially in sets that do um, predominantly claimant public law, there is that kind of issue that a lot of people have come from being a solicitor or being in a firm for a long time or doing something else. So I think that um, I, I know we and a number of others are, are just examining whether we have set the bar in a way which makes it very difficult, no matter how brilliant you are as a junior person. Uh, the other thing I would say is um, just check what the yardstick is for the individual chambers. And I realize that the 
process um, makes that quite difficult. But every single year when we do the pupillage sift, we get over a thousand applications and we get people who quite obviously have tried to do a one size fits all. And you can tell they've applied for Doughty Street and for Garden Court, but they've also applied for a specialist immigration set. And they've also applied for a set that does clinical negligence. And they're trying to be all things to all men and, uh, and women. And one of the best pieces of advice really is to think about where you're applying tailor your application in that way uh, and make sure that you're meeting the yardstick because I'm afraid in a very competitive field when we get one of those catch-all applications they just don't make it past the first round. Okay um, I'm going to return to Busola with her demand at the beginning that she wanted to be answered a specific question before I forget and get told off at the end. Busola answer your question. <laughs> Thanks. Um, also, in the Q&A, there was a question that uh, I said that I would answer live. I don't know if you want me to do that at the same time. Anyway, I'll start with the one I asked for, and then you can decide if you want me to take a break. So the question was, um, do clients treat you with respect and do you get, you know, sexism and racism at work? Um, when I first qualified, right, I had been to an all girls boarding school and I had three years at UCL with boys and I found that actually quite frightening because I've got three sisters and you know and I hadn't really lived with boys my older brother is he was 18 when I was born so he was at university when I was little so basically I'd never lived with men except my father and he doesn't really qualify and um and then I went to Lucy Cavendish which is a lovely college then with only women now it's got men as well and I didn't I didn't really know how to be assertive with men and um, I think that I found it very difficult to deal with male professionals when I qualified as a barrister. So I found it hard to be with um, male pupil masters. I wasn't assertive enough. I was a bit scared about it all. And over a period of time, I've developed techniques that I use such as so a lot of my work now is done with police officers and because the cases are big and serious they tend to be quite experienced and senior police officers and so i'm very conscious from the minute i meet them about how i present myself and i present myself as a you know professional i'm not trying to be anybody's mate i'm, I'm very careful about where i sit on the table and i think being a black woman is also it's a kind of dual intersectionality which can make people treat you in a certain way and you know treat you not as their equal but rather that they are your superior so i take the seat you know i take the head of the table seat and i um i'm very well prepared and i've got questions for everybody and actually if they step out of line i just tell them that's my job thank you you know i often have police officers trying to help me with the analysis of whether there's gross negligence or not and i say to them that's my role thank you what I'd like you to do is to get ABC evidence. Thank you. And so, you know, I, I think it's really important that the way in which you comport yourself um, uh, can affect how people treat you. In terms of racism, I didn't think any of this, I didn't think anything of it until Alexandra, I can't remember her surname, Wilson, was in the press last year about the fact that when she went to court she was people thought she was a defendant or something that happened to me all the time I would go with my standard issue Samsonite suitcase which every barrister in the world has at court with my black suit um, and a, a, a bag containing my wig and my gown I'd go through security and they'd say, Miss, family go into the court that way, Miss. Are you here for your brother? Oh, the cells are down that way, Miss. Are you waiting for your solicitor? I mean, it just happened twice a month and I didn't even think it was remarkable. Um, so this, the fact that Alison, uh, Alexandra was talking about it last year was saddening because it clearly still happens. She's rightly made a big fuss about it. But I think there's a lot of unconscious bias actually at work in, in the way that people approach you. Um, so what can you do about it in terms of clients and people you interact with? I think, as I said, I think it's worth doing a bit of prep about how you want them to see you. 
And the other thing is about being assertive and actually, you know, saying to that security guard who directs you to the public gallery because you're clearly the defendant's sister, now why do you think that is? And just, you know, let them come up with an answer. And so don't not being afraid about causing a bit of discomfort that challenges people um, uh, and makes them think about their unconscious bias, conscious, conscious or unconscious bias. Um, I'd like to come back to the imposter syndrome thing, but you know, Nikki, I'll, I'll shut up for, for the moment. No, don't, because um, I, I think it follows on quite nicely and I will open it yeah. up to everyone else around the table. Yeah. What's your first bite yeah. of imposter syndrome? So I've had it a lot. And um, when I saw the question, I just thought, I haven't had it so often, actually, so often recently. And I think what's happened is that, firstly, I'm in an area of law that I really, really love. I feel very comfortable and I feel uh, competent. So I'm generally feeling quite well prepared and, you know, competent. Um, what I have found very helpful is to have allies at work. So people to whom you can be completely honest and say, I'm feeling a bit scared about that conference because da -da 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 -da, and let them reassure you, listen to the reassurance and also use them as sounding boards for your ideas. So if there are tricky, tricky matters that you think are going to come up in that conference, run them past somebody whose who's legal judgment you trust and listen to their feedback about it and let, let yourself be challenged so that when you are in that meeting, you are speaking from a position of strength. So I think it's really important you have allies who will tell you the truth and who will support you and help you to build up your um, self-esteem. And then also the other thing is to prepare really well so that um, so that if you are challenged during the meeting or, you know, the court hearing, or whatever it is, you've got a good foundation on from which you can push back. And that's, I think, really done by being competent and preparing well. So there's, there are two, pi two pieces of work to be done in terms of the imposter syndrome. The first is get external support, get allies and get their help and bounce ideas off people. And the second is do your own prep so that you feel less insecure and you're better able to manage um, at, in the moment. I'll be quiet. Thank you very much. So there's a lot there for the rest of you to come in on. Um, racism, genderism, imposter syndrome. Um, you all have something to say on this one, I think. Who would like to go next? Um, I'd like to go next. Um, Basola, I'm glad you said what you said about um, your reaction to um, Alexandra. Um, saying that she was stopped because they thought she was a defendant's girlfriend. And, you know, of course it was like hue and cry on the BBC news. And I read that and I thought, yeah, welcome to my world 25 years ago. You know, everybody of our generation and subsequent generations happened, it happened to. The only difference that I noticed over the years is that I went from being the, the defendant's girlfriend to his mother. You know, so that was the only that was the only change, and I and I can recall the first time it happened, and I re, I know that I was at Thames Magistrates Court, and in those days, you know, I'm a bit scruffier today, but in those days, you know, as a, a new shiny barrister, I was really really well dressed, and in those days we had our breeze still with pink ribbons round it, and um, yeah, I'm from Bethnal, I grew up in Bethnal Green, and my accent has flattened out over the years. But back in the early 90s, and as clients used to remind me, I'd go into court, I'd start off quite posh, and I'd become more and more cockney as the hearing went on. And I was stopped by this security guard who asked me if I was a defendant's girlfriend. And I turned around to him and I said, listen, mate, what do you think I've got in my hand? It's got pink ribbon on it, isn't it? And he sort of looked at me. I said, I'm a barrister, I'm a barrister. Where'd I have to go? Because I was quite sort of, I was so taken aback and so angry about it. I thought, God, I've worked really hard to get to the, where I am. No disrespect to the defendant's girlfriend, but I'm here as a professional in my lovely shiny new suit with my pink ribbon and my brief. And this is how you treat me. And it, 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 it sort of made me angry, but it also deflated me. And I just thought, is this what the bar is going to be like? Um, and the thing that I've noticed about the bar, I've never encountered from clients overt racism, because that's not how it, that's not how it operates. 
quite often in this country anyway. It's it's a, often a low key level of racism that you that you know it's there, but you can't always put your finger on it. But you know it's there. It's the reluctant handshake. It's the uncomfortable them being uncomfortable in your presence. You know it's there. And sometimes I know it's it's been there with clients. But ultimately, what are they going to do? They've got no one else, <laughs> and the case is being called on in five minutes. So they've got to just you know put up and shut up really. And I think that's that used to happen a fair amount of times in the early days. Um, and so you know that 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 sort of sense of um, being deflated was something that I really noticed at the bar, which brings me on to the question of imp imposter syndrome. Coming as a graduate from Cambridge, and can I just go back to our last question about you know what things that you know undergraduates should do? At the end of the day, we are all Cambridge graduates, and regardless of whether you went to state school or public school, you come out with a Cambridge degree. It makes a difference. I applied as a pupil to all the lefty chambers, you know. Cloisters, Doughty Street, Garden Court, Tooks. I also, as an experiment, applied to some really pucker sets that I had no interest in them. And I, and I thought, I'll just see what will happen. They will see the name Alison Munro. They will see a graduate of Cambridge. And lo and behold, all of them gave me interviews. Some of them, you can see their faces drop as I walked through the door, because I wasn't what they were expecting. But, you know, we have to accept that, you know, as graduates from Cambridge, you are in a, at an advantage to many, many um, other young people who are, who are coming um, out of universities and trying to get um, into, the bar, into the bar and, and a slice of that cake. But going back to the um, imposter syndrome, I left Cambridge as a super confident 21 year old, you know, I, I felt I could take on the world. I was incredibly fearless. I look back at the person that I was at, at 19, 18, 19, 20, 21. And I think she was, you know, borderline insufferable, you know, that she was so enthusiastic about everything and was so go getting. And the bar knocks that confidence out of me, it chips away at you year after year after year. And despite the fact that I was in this lovely set of chambers, once I left chambers and I was going to court and I was facing judges who would, you know, treat you in a different way. Again, you could never quite put your finger on it, but sometimes you were treated differently. Your opponents would treat you differently. People sometimes would react um, with astonishment that you could you know, string a sentence together and use words of more than three syllables. You know, so that, it just knocked your confidence year after year after year. And I, there was a time that I thought, am I good enough for this? Should I be doing this? Um, and even as late as 2019, when I was applying for SILK, I was sitting there with this form in front of me thinking, why are you doing this, Alison? You're not going to get this. You're not good enough for this. You know, and, and, and I had to have phoned up a friend who said, don't be so stupid. Just put the application in. And that's what, what happens to a lot of women, to a lot of black people at the bar. You, 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 you almost talk yourself out of doing the job. Um, which is a, a terrible um, state of affairs. But as Basola says, you know, you, you, you know, you've got to, you've earned your place at that table. And, you know, we shouldn't feel that we, we have to do more and have to be twice as good as everybody else in order to level them. That shouldn't be the situation. And if I can just end up with a quote, I've used this quote before, but I think it's quite apposite at the moment that we've got um, Kamala Harris as the um, vice president in the US. Shirley Chisholm was a black woman um, who's born in New York. Um, she is Caribbean, Bayesian and Guyanese heritage. Um, which is my family's heritage. She's close to my heart as a, one of my heroines. But Shirley Chisholm, in 1968, she became the first black woman to be elected um, to the US Congress. She was a Democrat. And in 1972, she um, became the first woman of color to um, contest the Democratic um, presidential selection. Didn't succeed, obviously, but she was a pioneer. And Shirley Chisholm says this about, you know, you know, fighting for your place at the table. She said this, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. And I think that's something that I really would live by. And I would tell people, you know, don't wait for them to give it to you. You know, you bring your folding chair and you put yourself on that table and you claim your place. Olivia and Keelan, do you want to add anything on imposter syndrome or challenging prejudice? Um, yeah, unless Olivia wants to go first, I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, yeah, for me, um, I mean, obviously, it's nothing like what Alison and Abbasola have experienced as black women. Um, and, you know, I hear from a lot of my colleagues about microaggressions and repeated 
incidents. So, you know, one of my uh, colleagues who is Southeast Asian uh, often gets mistaken for the interpreter. That's the particular thing that she has when she goes to court. The assumption is she's there as an interpreter. It's no slight on interpreters, but why do you have her in that particular camp? And uh, many of my colleagues who are black women say it's just exhausting. So one of my colleagues who's been at the bar for about 30 years says every single time she goes to court in her suit with her wheelie bag, I mean, the most cliched picture of a barrister you can imagine, she braces herself for the security guard or the court clerk or the person who interacts with her in a way which belittles her. And that is just something which uh, many of our colleagues, particularly the pale, stale male ones, just don't have to deal with ever. And it, look, I have nothing like that, but, but as a woman, uh, there are many experiences, uh, despite uh, privilege as being a, a, a white woman, uh, there are many experiences which we have repeatedly, particularly at the bar, and I think it's particularly because it's a profession where you're self-employed um, and where you don't have a human resources department when things happen. So I'll just give you a couple of examples, because for me, I think many of us do experience imposter syndrome. And the reason for that is because the world often tells us that we don't belong or somehow that we're not good enough. So uh, first example is, um, since taking silk, I cannot tell you how many times people see my unusual name and just assume I'm a man. And it absolutely happens to me more as a QC than it did as a junior counsel. Absolutely. So people assume they see my name. They see uh, Keelan Gallagher QC. I get addressed as Mr. I turn up and they are visibly taken aback that a woman has turned up who's relatively young. I say in my mid 40s, I'll call myself relatively young um, and not just not what they pictured. And I have often been in a situation, and in fact, it happened to me very recently, where I've attended a hearing or a meeting with someone very junior who's male, most recently as a female silk with a pupil who was a man, where the assumption was that the pupil who was the man was the QC. That's the assumption. So, I mean, that just tells you. And of course, that's, that's discombobulating and difficult. And then your interaction with people, you're undermined right from the outset. So that's quite important. And I think the point Basola made earlier about, uh, you know, obviously being very brilliant at her job and people now recognizing that one of the difficulties at the bar, which a lot of my female colleagues, particularly the junior female colleagues describe is that um, they, every single time they meet a new client, they have the credibility gap that they've got to get over. So one of my colleagues uh, who's in her forties and um, also a Cambridge graduate was in a very senior role at the UN for a long time, looks very young. So, you know, if you were told she was 25, you'd believe it. Uh, she had any credibility gap in the UN and that assumption that maybe she's too young for the job is overtaken by the fact that she's in the role for a long time and people know who she is, people recognize her expertise. But it's quite different if you then are a junior criminal barrister, for example, and every single time you turn up to a cell to meet a client for the first time, or every single time you turn up in court, people are thinking, who's she? She looks very young. Surely she's too young to be the barrister. People make jokes about barristers getting younger all the time. And that's how her interactions tend to start, simply because uh, she has the advantage of looking rather younger than she uh, is. Um, so I, I think that's a key issue. And the other example I wanted to give is, um, and it, it really is, there's, there's a phrase which was used by uh, the founder of the Irish Country Women's Association, Mama MacDonald, a number of years ago, where she said, I didn't start out as a feminist. It was life that made a feminist out of me. And I always think, think of that when I remember something that happened to me. My eldest child is now 12. So about 13 years ago, um, when I was pregnant with my eldest child, I was very positive. Uh, I told people relatively early on about being pregnant, was quite, had a quite clear plan about how I was going to manage my practice, manage my maternity leave, had spoken to a lot of people. And uh, the experience I had of soft sexism, if I can put it that way, you know, came like a thump in the stomach. And it was that having told one of my colleagues, an ally, uh, you would think, about the pregnancy, I then later in the day, I got told by him, a uh, white man, much older, uh, he said, oh, a, a solicitor mentioned to me, he wanted to instruct you on a case. And I said, you're pregnant and you're very tired. And you just think, what do you do with that as a self-employed person? Do you ring the solicitor about the non-existent brief, which has gone elsewhere? Where do you go with behavior like that, which is well-meaning, but misplaced? And there's a particular problem with being self-employed with behavior like that. And people sometimes meaning well, but doing things which are really quite offensive. And against that backdrop, I just wanted to tell you um, when, uh, and Alison, you've obviously taken silk in recent years too, and you'll have had the same thing as me, the, uh, wonderful letter 
um, that uh, we got uh, from uh, the absolutely wonderful letter, and I, I see some of you nodding, from Eleanor Platt QC at One Garden Court, who took silk in 1982. Exactly. Um, I see you waving. And it started, dear female QC, I knew nothing about this until I had it. Uh, so when I got when I took silk in 2017, in my chamber's pigeonhole, I got a letter from Eleanor Platt QC saying, dear female QC, I attached to this email, as well as a letter of congratulation, a list now quite long of all female silks ever. And it made for very sobering reading. So reading it in 2017, it commenced with a list of women who died. So Helena Normanton, Rose Heilbronn, the first women silks in 1949. Uh, Helena Kennedy QC, one of my colleagues and a very close friend, Silk in 1991, shockingly, was only number 44 ever. I mean, you think about what was happening in the early 90s. She was only Silk 44 ever, alive or dead. The numbers don't even hit 200 until 2008, and they're climbing. But I was only number 397 ever. So at the time when I was made a Silk in 2017, fewer than 400 women Silks ever, alive or dead. And at that time, I looked up when I got that letter, the number of male silks in practice at the time. And the answer was 1,574 male silks. So there I was below number 400. And of course, what Alison says uh, about uh, female silks of color, the, the stats are even worse. So there is a huge, huge way to go. And that's why we have imposter syndrome because of numbers like that and attitudes like that. Thank you. I think we should push on so with some of the other questions. Um, uh, let's combine two of them. We've got in the audience a non-law PhD student who works on social justice issues. Do you think it's too late to make the shift to legal practice? Also, as someone currently on a PhD stipend and not from a wealthy background, what sort of financial support is available? Money was certainly going to raise its head in this discussion. And then um, I think we can connect it with Holly Sargent's question, who Holly has escaped corporate law to come to Cambridge as a graduate student. So on the topic of, it, on, uh, on the topic of exploring our passions, what level of autonomy do you have as a junior barrister to pursue pieces of work that you're passionate about? They're quite different, but I think you can combine where do you get money and how do you keep your passion going? Olivia, you've got to start because I didn't let you speak on the last round. That's fine, although I, I, I fear because I live with imposter syndrome permanently, <laughs> I fear that these are not my questions, really. But um, so far as autonomy... Sources of money, you can certainly advise where you find these mythical pots of money. Yeah, that's not that's not straightforward. Um, and there are, as I, as I know you know, but there are loans available for uh, the BTPC and there are scholarships available from the inns and if you manage to get pupillage sufficiently far in advance with a chambers which pays a sufficient sum of money some of those chambers uh, permit or, uh, or allow a drawdown of some of your chambers award during your um, bar school year. So there are some options, but I have to say, as far as I know, they really are very limited. And um, you are talking about, of course, a significant debt for bar school in particular. At, at least once you get pupillage, you're getting paid something. But bar school is a very tricky year financially. And as I say, most people finance it, I think, with loans. And then I certainly work throughout my bar school year. In fact, from a really practical perspective, if I had my time again, I would probably have split it over two years and done more legal stuff uh, to boost my CV and um, would have worked a bit more to earn some more cash as well. Because as I say, I worked in a pub three or four nights a week and was also trying to CV build because I didn't have pupillage when I started at bar school. The timing was all slightly different then. Um, and so I was desperately trying to make sure my CV was in the right place, but also that I could afford to pay for everything I needed to pay for living in London as a student at 22. So the financial sources, I think, are quite limited. And I'm happy for anyone else to jump in if they have more knowledge of that than I do. 
I think there's a related question, which is, um, are you rich enough? People want to know. Um, people have coded words that they ask. Have yes. you found the work financially sustainable? Um, it all depends what your aspirations are, I guess. Um, it does, I, 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 sorry, I'll just, I'll just jump in there quickly. I think Keelan said it earlier. Uh, it, it may have been someone else. I was listening to the legal aid panel yesterday, but no one comes to the publicly funded bar for the money. I think you have to be realistic about that before you start. You're never going to be driving a Porsche or flying first class at the publicly funded bar. And if those are your aspirations financially, then rethink now. Uh, there are ways to make it work. Uh, although I have to say one of the reasons I abandoned crime in the end completely was because it was not for me financially sustainable. And as a Cambridge graduate, you see your friends starting, you know, you all start earning absolutely nothing anyway, or pretty much at the same time when you're 22, 23. But very quickly, your friends start being able to go out for dinner and maybe even buy a flat and not worry about paying train tickets. And after five years of nothing but criminal defence and the problems with the legal aid agency that I think everyone knows that one has, I took the view that I just didn't, I, I never came to this job to be rich, but I also assumed I would be able to pay my bills every month. And that was not actually as straightforward as you think. So that was a, a factor in the move over to family, which I have to say is better paid, S still not. Uh, gold-plated, but significantly better paid than crime. So sorry, I'll let other people speak now. Lucola. Um, thank you, Nikki. Um, in terms of how do you pay for the training, I joined Inner Temple because I heard, I don't know if it's true actually, that it had the most amount of funds and the fewest number of members, and so the chances of getting a scholarship were slightly higher. I, I got a decent scholarship which paid for my bar school fees. I also took a bank loan, which, although it seemed enormous at the time, I did actually pay off after a number of years, you know, on target. So it's doable, but you're not rich. And I also worked um, during my bar school uh, year. Um, in terms of pupillage, uh, I think all pupillage now have to be paid. And I know about the CPS, I looked up before we started the meeting today that they pay their pupils uh, it, nationally outside London between 23 and a half to 26 and a half thousand a year. And in London, 25, 24 and a half to 28 thousand um, a year. And then you're pretty much guaranteed a job on um, what's the word, you know, or, on um, acceptable quality completion of your satisfactory completion of your pupillage and then you get taken on as a crown prosecutor and then after that as a senior crown prosecutor. Um, the advantage of being employed as opposed to self-employed of course is that you get start to contribute to a pension and the civil service pension is excellent. Um, you get holiday pay, you get sickness pay. So if you're, if you're ill, you can actually take a day off. Unlike when you're in chambers where you drag yourself in unless you've got, you know, your legs have been sh sh smashed under a bus, you know, and then you physically can't drag yourself in. So it's, I find it a really good way to balance my personal life and work. Now, I agree with Olivia, you're never going to be rich, but if you're not greedy, it is possible to live a decent life as, I mean, I work as a criminal barrister in, in the CPS. I think I'm very well paid. I'm not, I'm not going to be rich, but I'm very well paid and I can live comfortably. I'm able to buy a house. I've got a good pension, which I will eventually get if I'm ever able to retire and good benefits. I we're all working from home now, but generally speaking, I can work from home when I choose, even outside the, of the pandemic times. Um, and the, I think the CPS has become a very progressive employer. It's incredibly sympathetic to working parents. It's very um, encouraging of its staff to bring their whole lives, their whole persons to work. So, you know, I don't feel embarrassed or I don't find it problematical to talk about my African descent or, you know, if I've got friends who are openly gay at work and that's completely fine. So I think it depends on what you're after. What I was after really was finding a, an area of the law 
where my values were in alignment with the work that I was doing. My main motivation was wanting to work in an area where um, where I was contributing to the to the survival of the rule of law. So for Alison and for Keelan, it was about social justice. For me, it's not mutually exclusive. It's slightly different, but it was about working to ensure that the rule of law was working well and that nobody was um, above the law. I get that completely. Every single day of my life, I'm able to make a contribution which I feel is valuable. I mean, just very briefly, like, this is a slightly different tangent from the straight question. I, I was thinking about, you know, why I love this work so much and why is it that it satisfies my love of rule of law and I was just thinking about some cases that my team has dealt with recently so I prosecuted some police officers a few years ago who had been um, corrupt and who had been uh, chucking cases they didn't want to do basically a colleague of mine in my team prosecuted Charlie Elphick, who was the um, MP who was convicted of sexually abusing his uh, employees and also a former nanny. Um, I prosecute people for election offences. Um, it's really important to me that nobody is above the law and that people who are accused of have a good chance to defend themselves but then if they can't you know, if the if the state can prove the case against them that they be convicted and it's really important to me that you know i'm part of a system where that's possible and for that i don't need to be able to drive a porsche it's enough for me just to be able to live comfortably and with dignity and i get that in in the area of work that i, I that i do I can see the clock marching on and I want to bring in Erica Sands question because well done Erica for not being anonymous attendee and this is a question for Alison what you said about the bar knocking the confidence out of you resonates with me quite a bit regarding my experience at Cambridge I'm wondering how you managed to bounce back and if you have any tips on this um yes Erica I surround yourself um, with good people. Um, you need um, a good support network, be that your family, be that colleagues. It doesn't have to be lots of people, but you need those people around you. That So when you come back from court, I'll give you a really sort of graphic example. I did a case once and we made an application. We, you know, it wasn't made um, prior to the hearing, but it didn't have to be because something arose. It was a family case. This was, this was quite a few years ago. Um, and the other parties, I think I was one of the parents, the other parties were sort of grumbling slightly, but you know, these things happen and they didn't make a big song and dance about it. And we went into the court and the judge turned to me and said, Miss Munro, in this country, we don't deal with palm tree justice. And I kind of looked around the court thinking, well, that's really racist. Everyone's going to be, you know, backing me up on that. And nobody did. My client just sort of sat, sat there with her head in her hands thinking, God, you know, see if things weren't bad enough, the judge really hates my barrister as well. And afterwards I said, didn't, did no one hear that? And they were like, no, not really. And they just kind of left it. And I, I, I was, almost in tears, but I thought, I'm, you know, going to front this out. And I went home and I sort of remember pacing around the room thinking, what am I going to do about this? What am I going to do about this? And I phoned up um, Mike, Mike Mansfield. I said, Mike, this is what happened today. And he was like, who's the judge? Which court were they in? <laughs> and he literally got on the phone straight away to have it out with them and said, whatever, whatever fallout, I'll take the fallout. We've got your back. And knowing that, you know, and th when things like that happened, you know, there were other women particularly, you know, there were some really amazingly strong women um, at Tooks who as, as a young barrister, they kind of, you know, they kind of cradled you and nurtured you and they were there when you came back and you were feeling down and they would see, you know, why are you looking a bit miserable? You're usually smiling and laughing at us and what's wrong? And you'd tell them and they'd be, I've experienced that. This is how we deal with it. We don't, you know, we don't internalize it. And, and that, having that constantly someone saying you know don't internalize it talk to us you know we will have your back made a huge difference um which is why i persevered and also because of the you know the love of the job you know it's as keelan says you know i wouldn't get out of 
bed on a, on a cold winter morning to get on a train at King's Cross at six o'clock to go to Manchester or Durham or Cardiff or whatever um, to, do a, to do a corporate case. But I do it for, for the clients and I do it for the work I, I do. So I think it's a combination of doing something and making sure you're doing um, work that you are passionate about, that you, you do feel really passionate about, but having that support network that's going to cradle you, but also sort of sometimes giving you tough love and saying, you know, don't, you know, don't internalize this, don't take this, don't, you know, slouch and literally let it grind you down. You've just got to, you know, face up to these people because you are good enough. You know, Sandra Graham was my pupil supervisor and um, she sadly passed away and amazed, quite young. Um, an absolutely amazing woman. She was funny, she was clever, she was brave, she was bold. And Sandra would always, you know, sort of set me straight. Whenever I was going down a little bit, she'd be there. And, and, and there are people like that. I mean, that's a fantastic thing as well, that there are people like that at the bar. Keelan will tell you this um, from her experiences as well. There are people, good people at the bar who are there, you know, for, uh, you know, because they want to do the right thing, do right. Doing the right thing and doing right isn't the same as necessarily doing justice. Um, to do right um, and be fearless, there are people like that. So Erica, that's that's how, I mean, that's how I found a mechanism to bounce back. Um, and, you know, in terms of tips I would give you, because, you know, I understand that, you know, you, you say that your experience of Cambridge is, is similar and it resonates. Um, because I was so involved in, in politics and and it kind of at some one point was kind of slightly all consuming um, to me. Um, but I, I know that you know people that I'm still friends with now, people who were my contemporaries had a very, very different experience of Cambridge and had three quite miserable years. And, you know, for a very good friend of mine, she if you if she was here, she would have a very, very different tale to tell about her experience um, being in a um, that, I think um, when when we got when we first came in eighty five, um, Peter House had just taken women. And she was one of the first intakes. Horrific. It was horrific, and I remember it. Some of it was absolutely horrific. You know. So I can interrupt because I'm going to move you on. But I'd also say just very briefly to Erica uh, and to to Alison, Cambridge in the pandemic is of course particularly isolating for students. I feel really. My heart bleeds for students who are not able to go and join political clubs in the way that you were able to. And Erica, I hope that you can reach out and find sympathetic allies out there. They are tough times. Uh, a not unrelated question comes from anonymous attendee, which is a variation on the question which are often asked of criminal barristers. How can you ever defend somebody you know is guilty? And um, what anonymous attendee says is, are you always working for the right client? And I thought it was worth asking you that question because I think most of you, certainly Persona is always working for the right client, I think as far as she's concerned. And most of you have positioned your career so that you don't have this problem about how can you deal with cases where you feel you're perhaps on the wrong side? For example, arguing in defense of human rights claims rather than for them. Is it something that still happens to you all? Olivia and then Keelan. For me, less in terms of the human rights aspect, but certainly I am uh, regularly representing those who, if the question were in relation to criminal proceedings, would be considered guilty. And uh, a, a client I had relatively recently was accused of and found by the court to have killed her adopted child. So, uh, yeah, it's... Uh, it's part and parcel of the job and it's just something that you do because you have to and it's essential because how could the justice system function properly if you weren't to that, uh, that's my answer anyway Keelan I think you had something to add I have to say something really quick just on that which is um First of all, if you haven't seen it, it's worth seeing Dinah Rose's rather brilliant letter yesterday on the cab rank principle. Um, you've probably seen it, but if you haven't, um, do take a look. Uh, it was published by Joshua Rosenberg. Um, I would have a look at that, about arguing the Cayman Islands case. Um, I, I don't express any view on that. She, she's against my colleague, Edward Fitzgerald, QC, who's acting in the case. Um, 
for the women who want to seek gay marriage. But if you look at that, there's been a very interesting debate in the last 24 hours on Twitter on that precise issue. Uh, the other thing I would say is um, that in, uh, the, the, well, two other things. The first thing is I entirely agree with the point that's just been made about the rule of law and our job as barristers being to represent our clients' interests. And under the cab rank principle within England and Wales, that's what you do. Now, it's quite different when you're looking at some international issues, for example. So there is no obligation to accept a case um, arguing for the death penalty. For example, there's a range of cases where you can have red lines, um, which are international cases and where those issues don't arise. But just domestically, the picture is quite complicated. So just to give you an example, within my chambers, um, my colleagues who do criminal defence, which I don't do, um, sometimes act in cases where they are acting for an individual uh, who is from the state body or the organization like CERCO or G4S in criminal proceedings where other colleagues of mine are acting for the bereaved family in the inquest. Or similarly, some of my colleagues who do international criminal law uh, represent on an international stage individuals accused of the most appalling crimes against humanity. Uh, and they represent them uh, in criminal defense internationally uh, when there's obviously a human rights side to that, but there's also a human rights side in acting for the victims and in seeking accountability for those forms, th those forms of um, th those actions. So uh, it's also important just to remember that actually in the human rights field, uh, often the human rights role can be on one side or the other, and the picture is a lot more complicated uh, than just thinking you're on the right side or the wrong side. So um, I hope that helps. Thank you. Um, Julia, you've been very quiet. I'm going to ask you in a minute whether you have a question before we come to the end. But before that, Pusola wants to come in. Oh, sorry, I'll be really quick. I was only going to say that, you know, I'm very lucky in my job that if I think that somebody is being prosecuted and that that decision is incorrect, I can take steps to stop that. Um, and so... You know, I, it's a it's a privilege actually to be in that position, and I think although I don't myself defend anymore, I did used to defend, and I always think when I'm asked that question, if it were my sister or me or my brother or my mother who were accused of something terrible, would I want them just to be you know thrown to the wolves, or would I want them to be to be protected? with the law and to be represented properly so that the law was applied you know as fairly as possible so that justice was done and i think there is no alternative really to make sure to making sure that even people we think are dreadful who have done terrible things are treated in accordance with that law and that's only going to be possible if they're well represented so i don't i didn't find it terribly difficult to to defend when i used to do it and i don't at all find it difficult to prosecute um yeah that was all i wanted to say really thank you julia firstly can i just say thank you everyone very much it's really inspiring to hear from women who are basically just leading the way for the rest of us. I think one of the questions that I get asked quite a lot as the president of the Graduate Law Society is more of a practical side about, well, we know we want to do it, we know we love this, but how do we get there? It's so competitive, so many people in this field. So I suppose on a sort of application point, how does one really, beyond the, the, the generic, well, make sure that you've got X, Y, Z, make sure you've got the grades and the many pupillages, but what is it that in terms of a passion, you can really show that'll make you stand out? Because as we know, it's particularly tough in a pandemic for anyone to get any work experience. You can't go out there and do things. So for, for any of, of our listeners today who, who have decided they want to be a barrister, I know a lot of people in the chat have already done the bar course. What can they do that makes them really stand out? And what about that extra question from um, anonymous attendee again about is it significantly more difficult to get a pupillage with a 2-1? Well, I think the answer has to be, doesn't it? Of course, it's more difficult to get a pupillage with a 2-1 than a first, except there's so much more to you than your degree. And a fabulous person with a 2-1 will get the pupillage ages before the boring person with a first who hasn't got any life in their head. I don't know whether you can give any more advice to anonymous attending as well as answering Julia's question. Rosola. Um, I had a look at this just before we logged on and in terms of the CPS, um, they have a minimum requirement of a 2-2 two and then if you meet certain eligibility criteria and you 
then you you get considered properly. So if you can step over that hurdle of getting at least a two two, you are considered at the same um, in the same way as everybody else. So that's certainly the case with the civil service. So you know I, I can speak about that. And and then after after that first stage of getting to being considered and going through the paper sift, then it's kind of up to you actually to sparkle and to show who you are at the, at the following in the following rounds, which consists of a legal test and an interview and role play and all sorts of other things. So once you can jump that first hurdle and get past the same paper sift, then you are absolutely considered considered with everybody else. So Priscilla is busy selling the CPS and the government legal service. Which of the rest of you would like to speak? Alison. Um, I think that Olivia and Keelan um, alluded and spoke about this earlier. Um, when you're applying, do your research, um, you know, tailor your application to those chambers that you want to apply for. So that it's not a sort of bland generic document that it actually shows that you've looked at who is here, what work are they doing? Why are they doing that kind of work? You know, show, show an interest, tailor your application accordingly. And, you know, a first as opposed to a two one, that's not the end, that's a criteria, but it's not the only criteria. You know, I've been doing, at Tooks, I used to be on the pupillage and tenancy committee for many, many years. And um, I've, I saw the changes that, you know, initially it used to be people would send in letters and CVs and it became far more formalized and it's sort of similar to sort of applying to university. You know, you have proper forms and people actually applied equal opportunity criteria and all the rest of it. So you look at the person as a whole and, you know, someone, not everybody is going to have the money or the ability to go off and do internships in the UN and do exciting things abroad and work in Strasbourg in their spare time. You know, there were people, I can think of people that we gave pupillage to who had done none of that because they couldn't afford to. They spent their year between university graduating and doing their pupillage, applying for pupillages, working in a local shop, you know, to earn enough money to, you know, help help out their parents, you know. So you look at the, if you look at the individual, what is this person going to be bringing to chambers? You know, what what is this person going to be adding to the chamber? So you need to think about all those different skills and there are a myriad when you sit down and you think about yourself as a person and what you can bring so a couple you know so a couple that was doing real research into the um, chambers and it will and it will stand out and those people do stand out so it's not solely on academic criteria or which university you went to or how many internships you did you know they to an extent you know they are secondary really to you as the individual and why you want to be a barrister to show that passion that Keelan spoke about so I mean I, I that's what I look for when um, sifting through pupillage applications. Keelan you're itching to get in. Just a quick thing uh, well two things I, I will answer that question in a moment I just wanted to say uh, just a couple of sentences on the question earlier about money um, which I know is not something we necessarily talk about that much but um I think it is that there are quite a few questions about whether this work is financially sustainable. And I did just want to flag, I mean, this is not hair shirt, you know, we're all very privileged. You know, you look at the average income that people earn around the country, and this is a job where people uh, can and do um, earn good money. Now, it, you're it is all not, not earning more than teachers and social workers, aren't you? Well, exactly. That's exactly what I was going to say. I mean, you, you know, I mean, the amount, it, obviously, we're not going to all air the precise amounts, but, you know, we do earn more than teachers and social workers, people who do really fundamentally important jobs. We earn more than a lot of doctors and so on. And the other thing is within publicly funded work, there's a huge range. Now, where the real crunch point comes is criminal defence work. Criminal defence work at the moment is under tremendous pressure. And for those of you who haven't seen it, you should try to catch up on the APPG, the All Party Parliamentary Group on Legal Aid. Uh, their sessions are all available online and you can see the brilliant work that's been done there. And you can see the evidence about just how appallingly low um, the pay is uh, at the bar in particular um, for junior criminal defence barristers. And also the impact of swinging cuts to legal aid, unfortunately, has had a particular impact on uh, women particular impact on people from um, a minority background 
uh, because they tend to be more, there's quite good statistics, they tend to be more in criminal defence and other areas that have been badly hit. But there's other areas of publicly funded work which are actually relatively well paid and we're all pretty comfortable. So, for example, if you do public law work, the bottom line is um, that actually the amount we're being paid hourly, you know, it might be less than some of our other colleagues at the bar. It's still pretty good, actually. Um, and there are serious delays with payments. But if you win your cases and you get inter partes costs, you get paid at commercial rates. So, you know, I, I just want to talk brass tacks. We are earning far, far more than the vast majority of people in this country. And uh, I do think that's important. I don't want people to think that um, it's the equivalent of doing a kind of voluntary job and it's, it's all very low paid because that's not necessarily the case. And if you are concerned about finances, but you are driven to do social justice work, just think carefully about what specific bits you want to do, because some of them are better paid than others. And there are ways to make it uh, work and for you to be very comfortable on how to get there. People have made brilliant comments on the 2122 issue. Can I just say this? Of course, it's undoubtedly more difficult if you don't have a first and you are against people who have fantastic results uh, all the way through top of their class, top of their year and so on. But there are many, many examples of people with two twos and even lower who have carved out very successful careers at the bar. And if you don't know him, I recommend that you take a look at my colleague Tunde Okuale, uh, who founded Urban Lawyers, who speaks very openly about the fact that he's from a Hackney council estate. He got a 2-2 in large part because he was working in Sainsbury's whilst trying to do his law degree because he was uh, under a lot of financial pressure within his family. And when he applied to our chambers, he was completely upfront about his circumstances. And uh, like Alison, I've gone through many of these forms. And when people say, you know, the reason that I don't have super duper list of um, mooting competitions and doing all these fancy internships is because in order to make my, make my way through university, I needed to work in a bar. You know, when they spell it out and explain it, and it's clear, that is taken into account. And many chambers now have a recognition of life circumstances and difficulties, and they take that into account. So if there's a good reason, explain it. And I would just emphasize that. And finally, uh, I put it in the chat, but in case people haven't seen it, the Human Rights Lawyers Association um, has a specific bursary, which was parked in the last year because of COVID, but it's a specific bursary for people who do not have the financial means uh, to do an internship at the UN or other roles which might involve uh, either working unpaid or needing to travel. And you can make an application to them for funding in order to do a specific piece of work which you otherwise couldn't do for financial reasons. And I've put the link in the chat in reply to one of the questions. And I urge you to take a look at that. There are opportunities like that which you can use if you're under financial pressure to bolster your CV. And I'm going to stop it then because we've hit the witching hour and I want to say you're all brilliant, wonderful, fantastic. And we could go on all evening, but we're not going to go on all evening. Really, thank you amazingly. Um, Julia, do you want to say anything? I want to say thank you to Julia and then I'll give the last word to Albertina. I just want to thank everyone for coming as well and to let you know that some good news is that we are uh, everyone really on our committee bar one are females so we're going to hopefully uh, try and claw some of those figures back to something that's a little bit less uh, unbalanced but thank you very much Albertina thank you Claire thank you Dan and Nikki thank you so much for your wonderful chairing um, I'm so grateful that everyone uh, could attend and this has been really inspirational thank you we're really grateful Thank you very much. Here. Thank you very much. I seem to have some trouble turning my video on, but I'm here. Thank you so much for a wonderful uh, session. It's been really inspirational and for giving up your time to be with us today. Thank you so much. And also thank you to, to Nikki for excellent sharing. Thank you. Bye bye everybody. And make sure you go to the bar. They need you. <laughs>